Uh, hush of anticipation. Well, good morning, everyone. It's, um, it's good to be together, isn't it? Uh, gathered together as church, as family together, and, uh, and please do stick around. We're not just a service. We are a wonderful community of followers of Jesus, people on the journey towards following Jesus, people just checking out faith, wherever you are at on your faith journey this morning, just really want to welcome you into this space, whether you're joining us online or you're here in the building, and those in the building, stick around, have some lovely tea and coffee, let's get to know each other even more, because God has placed us in an amazing community that is so good to be part of. Now, as part of this community, we are going to be journeying some stuff over the next, uh, over the next sort of couple of months, uh, a new teaching series called Live No Lies. And it is based on some of the teaching that John Mark Comer has drawn together and a book that he's recently published, which I read over Christmas. And it's one of those books that um, some books take me a very long time to read. Some I just read, and I'm not a very fast reader, as Sarah will tell you. Have you ever shared a page of a book with someone and you're both reading? And one person is like twice as fast as the other. And I keep telling you, I haven't finished yet. I'm only halfway through the page. So Sarah's fast. I'm slow. But this book I read in just about two or three days. I just found it so spoke into some of my experience of life and the world and where we find ourselves just in this cultural moment at this time. So a few of us on the team read it. And we just felt actually to be able to share some of this teaching would be really helpful for all of us. So that's what we're going to do over the next um, sort of uh, eight weeks or so. Live No Lies by John Mark Cohen. Now, I know some of you have got ahead of the game and have read some of the book already, which is brilliant. You're like those people at school who did the the pre-course reading, who uh, I was never one of those people. So well done if you have. But there are some other resources that go along with this series. Obviously the book, which we're going to, we're taking a lot of the teaching from that and, uh, and, and using that. But there is also currently a podcast series called Live No Lies, which John Mark Cameron has brought out, which accompanies this. Got about six parts with some interesting interviews with various people. But what I would really recommend, probably over and above that, is this one called This Cultural Moment, which came out two or three years ago. There are three series, and it's between a conversation between John Mark Comer and Mark Sayers, who is an Australian uh, church leader who really thinks about culture and those sorts of things. And it's, it's brilliant. I remember listening to it when it first came out, and it just started to give me a language for some of the things that I was sensing and feeling about culture, where we are in the church, what God's plan is. And it starts um, being quite, quite challenging. But it really brought me through to a powerful, fresh place of hope for the plans and purposes God has in our generation, this place. So if you do listen to that one, this cultural moment, there are three series. They're all quite short, about 20 minutes. But go and start right at the beginning. Don't don't run them through in the order you see on Spotify because you've been going through them backwards and it won't make much sense. Go back and find the first one and listen in. I'd really encourage that. And just one more thing as well while we're on this whole sort of topic. Has anyone had read the screw tape letters? It's a few. It's a Christian classic, C.S. Lewis. But I would encourage you to read that at some point if you want something slightly different to read um, by C.S. Lewis. I won't uh, go into too much detail about it. Read up a synopsis of it. It's very clever, but very, very insightful. And it's quite entertaining reading at the same time. So, live no lies. So we're just done. I'm just going to introduce the series today, really. Uh, that's the purpose of today. And then we're going to get into more of the meat of it over coming weeks. So um, 1930s. Feels a long time ago now. Um, there were some here who were born in the 1930s, but not many. My parents were born in the 1930s. And it was a pretty tumultuous time for the Western world. You had um, uh, the world was recovering, starting to recover from the Great Depression. You had fascism on the rise uh, and turmoil about to come to Europe. Um, and many people feared their would be another terrible war, and sadly there was. But also, what was going on at the time, many scientists were speculating that there might be life on Mars. And so, in the United States, in, on the 30th of October, 1938, many Americans turned on their radio. And as they tuned in to their radio, they started to hear news reports. News reports initially from astronomers who were observing some strange happenings on Mars, some strange sort of um, explosions seeming to happen on Mars. And not long after, another news report came through of a meteorite that landed about 20 miles outside 
uh, of New York. Um, and uh, so a, a little later, another news report came on, and, and a CBS reporter, um, Carl Phillips, was reporting live from the scene of this meteorite that had landed. And as he looked and observed and started to describe it, actually, this meteorite wasn't a lump of rock, but instead, actually, it was this metal cylinder. And as he watched and described to millions of people listening, he described as this cylinder started to open, and then the broadcast continued with these terrifying words. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I've ever witnessed. I can see peering out of that black hole two luminous disks. Are they eyes? It, it might be a face. But that face, it, ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. The eyes are black and, and gleam like a serpent. The, the mouth is V-shaped with saliva dripping from its rimless lips that seem to quiver and pulsate. What's that? that there's a jet of flame springing from the alien. It leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. Good Lord, they're turning into flame. Now the whole field's caught fire. the woods, the barns, the gas tanks of automobiles. It's spreading everywhere. It's coming this way. And suddenly there was silence on the radio and just the hiss of radio static. Soon other reports started to be broadcast of similar happenings taking place in other locations of the National Guard being called out. There was an announcement by the Secretary of State urging all Americans to stand against the alien invaders. Many people who were listening were absolutely terrified. Um, there were uh, st stories of a full-scale sort of pandemonium in the streets of um, pregnant women going into labor early, some people even um, committing suicide. And then these happenings in various towns, in one small town, uh, members uh, of the town, the, the men in the town went out with their guns and started shooting at, at a water tower because they thought it was an alien craft. Somewhere else, a woman burst into a prayer meeting saying, uh, have you heard the news? New York's been destroyed. It's, it's the end of the world. I suggest you go home and die. For though terrified, those people who heard that broadcast the world as they knew it was over. An alien invasion had taken place. The world was at war with people from another planet. But there was no alien invasion. It was a lie. It was a very clever one, and it wasn't intended, I don't think, to cause that mass panic and chaos. But what was actually happening is that Orson Welles and his theater group had adapted the novel by H.G. Wells called The War of the Worlds. They'd reset it in a contemporary time and they'd broadcast it as a play on the radio. And I had to listen to some of it this week because you can listen to it on, uh, on YouTube. Um, and it's, it's very convincing. But what happened is there was a very popular program on another channel that finished a few minutes, probably about five, ten minutes, after Orson Welles' radio play had started. So people had missed the first bit, which made it quite clear it was a play, and then hit the next half hour of the program, which was these fictitious but very realistic news reports. Now at the time, because of the background, the turmoil in the world at the time, people were used to their radio broadcasts of other programs being interrupted by breaking news, particularly from Europe with what was going on with Germany in particular, and, uh, and it always being bad news. And the result was crazy, really. These are some of the um, news headlines from the next day. Fake radio war stirs terror throughout the US. Panic sweeping the US. US bans fake radio alarms. And Orson Welles, um, very soon police were invading the radio studio. And Orson, studio, and Orson Welles had no idea about it. And there was this terror and panic. But why mention this at the start of a teaching series uh, called Live no lies, because actually it is a, uh, a powerful metaphor for much of what we're going to be talking about over the teaching series, because we are at war, not with aliens from Mars, but with an enemy that's far more dangerous and insidious. We are at war with lies. 
I don't know about you, but do you ever feel that as you try to follow Jesus in this current cultural moment, that there's a war for your soul? Do you ever ask why you feel so tired and worn out, not in body, but in mind, or why you feel on days just so battered and bruised? Why every day can feel like a battle just to stay faithful as a follower of Jesus? And maybe that's because it is a battle. Um, our spiritual ancestors, followers of the way of Jesus, often spoke about three enemies of the soul the world, the flesh, and the devil. And they saw these enemies of the soul as kind of alien, alien invaders from hell that were waging war against us. Now, I know that we don't often talk about this kind of stuff, and it can feel quite uncomfortable talking about this kind of language. And I feel slightly uncomfortable, if I'm honest, and a little nervous uh, sharing. Like, this is not the sort of thing that we normally talk about. However, I think it's really important for us to journey through some of this stuff. Now, when it comes to the world, the flesh, and the devil, that exact phrase um, isn't used by Jesus, and it's not used by the New Testament writers. But the language and the categories are there in Scripture. If we look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, as for you, You were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. There we go, the world being talked about. And of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That's Paul talking about the devil. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of the flesh and following the desires and thoughts. And Paul regularly likened following Jesus to being at war. Later on in Ephesians chapter 6, he writes this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He reminds Timothy to fight the good fight of faith. Later on, he says this to Timothy. Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well. This is the language of of war. And yet, Jesus was fiercely non-violent. With all that was done to him, he didn't retaliate. He turned the other cheek. He lived out the very words that he'd spoken. As were the New Testament writers, fiercely nonviolent. Most of them were martyred and put up no fight against those who did it to him. And the early church fathers and mothers up to the fourth century were almost all pacifists. It's because actually uh, our war against the enemies of the soul are not the war of guns and bombs. It's not a war against people. Paul makes that clear in Ephesians. It's not people we're battling, but spiritual battle. And ultimately, it's a war on lies. The problem of lies, not so much, it's not so much that we tell them, but it's more that we live them. We let false narratives about reality into our bodies And they wreak havoc with our souls, just as those Americans in 1938 allowed that false narrative about alien invaders to wreak havoc for that short time before they realized that actually it was all made up. And as followers of Jesus, we are at war with the world, the flesh, and the devil. And it plays out a little bit like this. And this is the sort of working thesis for the, uh, the teaching series we're embarking upon. That is that deceptive ideas, lies from the devil, play to disorders, orders, desires, it's the flesh, that are normalized in a sinful society. Deceptive ideas, 
play to disordered desires in ourselves, and those things are normalized in a sinful society. And so we go along and we're drawn in by the lies. So the ancient Chinese general, Sun Tzu, anyone know him? Yeah? He wrote a book called The Art of War. Um, He said this, he said, know your enemy. So when we know our enemy, it's like the church football team did a little bit of research, not on their enemies, but on the opposition. They know how they're going to play, they know what they're going to do, and they're better prepared when they go into battle on the football pitch. Know your enemy. And the purpose of this series really is to unmask the face of our enemies, those three enemies, and develop a strategy to fight back. And as we do this, what we need to do is to understand the cultural moment in which we live. Now, our generation is actually living through three tectonic shifts in Western culture that really affect everything uh, that we experience. The first is that we have moved, as followers of Jesus, from the majority to the minority. So over the last 50 years... Followers of Jesus have actually become what sociologists would call a cognitive minority. So whereas previously um, our worldview, our value systems, our practices, our social norms would have been widely shared across our culture, certainly here in the UK and much of the West, whereas now they are increasingly at odds with those around us. And we face constant pressure from both those on the right and those on the left to assimilate and follow the crowd and to follow culture. Secondly, our place in culture is shifting actually from a place of honor to a place of shame. So if you take a walk around any major European city, you'll see monuments, statues, inscriptions on buildings, even buildings built up to as late as the 1950s, which are it contained the language of scripture and the language of Christian faith. So this here um, is a picture of BBC Broadcasting House, just about to emerge. This is BBC Broadcasting House, which was, um, I think the, it was sort of founded in 1931, opened in 1932, the BBC. And if you see on the right, uh, over the, in the entrance hall above that statue is an inscription. And I think the inscription is in Latin. And this is what it says. This temple of the arts and muses is dedicated to Almighty God by the first governors of broadcasting in the year 1931, Sir John Reith being Director General. It is their prayer that good seed may be sown, uh, uh, good seed sown may bring forth a good harvest, that all things hostile to peace or purity may be banished from this house, and that the people inclining their ear to whatsoever things are beautiful and honest and of good report may tread the path of wisdom and uprightness. That was the founding of the BBC, and it wasn't that long ago. It feels rather different now, doesn't it? In the past, many government leaders were openly followers of Jesus. Most of our major universities were founded by uh, Christians. They were Christian foundations as well as many of our schools. Many intellectuals and scientists and artists were also followers of Jesus quite openly. And the church held a place of honor in wider culture. But not anymore. Today, Many people want nothing to do with faith in the public sphere. Who here remembers Alistair Campbell when referring to Tony Blair? Alistair Campbell was one of his, Tony Blair's main spin doctor, and he was asked about Tony Blair's faith, and he famously said, we don't do God. That was his response. And what's more, the church is often seen as part of the problem rather than part of the solution, with the radical moral reversal around human sexuality and gender and the life of the unborn. We often now actually hold the moral low ground in people's eyes. Jesus' vision of human sexuality is seen as immoral by a large swathe of the population in the Western world. We're no longer seen as the upstanding citizens. We instead are the dangerous counterculture. And thirdly, moved from widespread tolerance 
of the church and followers of Jesus to rising hostility, certainly in the public sphere. Increasingly, some people don't just think of us as a bit odd and unusual because we save sex for marriage and we give away a percentage of our income and we refuse to be held by generally accepted ideologies. But some now see us as dangerous. They're perceived as a threat to secularism's alternate vision of human flourishing. And we can live under the weight of that, can't we? You know, the stigma, the slander, the wound uh, to our hearts, when we feel at odds with those around us, it can feel exhausting when we look at our news feeds and read our social media. And I, my personal experience of that is that there are I felt this morning a little bit, actually. I tend to, on a, a Sunday morning, I'll get up and I'll, I'll pray, but I always do just check the news, because, and I check the news most days, but I check the news just in case something's happened uh, nationally, locally, that I should be aware of before coming to church and, and leading a service. And, and I felt, again, this morning, you know, I, I quickly checked the news, and I just felt a sense of heaviness and a bit of a sense of loneliness, um, when I feel just that everyone's, or many people's values and sense of morality just seem so at odds with those of Jesus and those that I hold. It doesn't feel like it used to be like that 20 years ago when I was growing up, and yet so much of the narrative I hear around me, folks, we feel heavily, heavy and a little lonely in the context of the world I live in. Or have you ever experienced that thing, you know, when you're with a group of friends who who, who perhaps not believers at work or at school, when they're cheering on a colleague's or a friend's life choice, thinking it's amazing, and you're seeing it and just sensing the pain and the disaster that's awaiting that person through some of the choices they've made. You just feel different, you feel slightly at odds, and yet you love those people. The Bible describes that experience as being in exile. Peter alludes to it in 1 Peter, actually starts off the whole letter with these words, to God's elect, exiles, scattered. And he finishes it with this sentence, see, she who is in Babylon, send her your greetings. Babylon was where the people of Israel were sent, in exile. Walter Brueggemann described exile as this, the experience of knowing that one is alien, and perhaps even in a hostile environment where the dominant values run counter to one's own. Now, in the past, you would probably need to possibly work in a you know, very far left organization, probably, uh, or live in a particularly liberal city like you know, Amsterdam or San Francisco to experience that sense of exile. And yet today, in the digital world we live in, all you need is an iPhone and some Wi-Fi. And many have described what we live in today as, for followers of Jesus, as digital Babylon. It's not an easy place to live in on days. In fact, most days, it's not. Every day can feel like a war on our souls, a fight to hold on to our faith, to stay faithful to Jesus, to stay sane. And with that can often come an underlying sense of anxiety. It comes easy. I don't know if this is just me or, or, or anyone else experiences here, but it's easy, become easy to think, you know, am I crazy to believe what I live? To, 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 am I crazy to believe what I believe, to live the way I live when everyone else around me is doing things so, so differently? And it can become especially hard when we see Christians who we respected and trusted, who've been our friends, begin to assimilate with the culture around us, beginning to take on values and ideologies that just seem to contradict scripture and contradict 2,000 years of Christian practice. It's hard when we recognize how our own values have begun to assimilate with those of the prevailing culture. I remember having a conversation about this a few years with, uh, ago with Phil Orchard and just you know, watching Watching films, romantic films. There's always, most films have some romance in, don't they? They have that sense where uh, there's a bit of a journey. Eventually the couple get together. And, and I remember um, always sort of just hoping that 
there'd be something of the Christian sexual ethic in it, that they wouldn't end up in bed together. There could just be romance without always having to lead to premarital sex. But I realized a few years ago that just subtly and subconsciously, I was now, I was almost willing that on to happen, not because I wanted to see some sex, but because it almost felt that was the fulfillment of a relationship. That was the pinnacle that people reached. And so wasn't it wonderful? I had to check my heart and go, actually, what's changed in me? that I've absorbed from a prevailing culture a different way of seeing the world. And it's easy for us to look back, isn't it, at the War of the Worlds fiasco in 1938 and laugh at how people were taken in. It seems ridiculous. How ridiculous it is. How could they be so naive? It's harder for us to admit that actually many intelligent, educated Americans were taken in by that very broadcast, or that at the same time in Germany, many educated, intelligent, moderate people were being drawn in by Nazism that led to six million Jews gassed in gas chambers. It's easy to think that we are far too sophisticated today to be taken in by lies. We're too enlightened to be played or manipulated by people in power or by people of influence, that we would never do something just because everyone else is doing it, or think something just because everyone else is thinking it. And there's something that C.S. Lewis calls chronological snobbery, that innate human bias that makes us think that we're smarter than the people who came before, and therefore any new idea is a good idea, better than an old one. Sociologists call it the myth of progress, the idea that everything is always getting better. But my experience as I look around, is that there is a substantial amount of evidence that everything isn't getting better. You and I are locked in a war with lies. And the sooner we recognize that, the sooner that we're able to fight back. And if you're not convinced by what I'm sharing this morning, I just want to ask you some questions and see where they relate. You know, if you're not convinced, then ask yourself this. Why is my mind under so much duress? Why do I feel inflicted by the ideologies of our time? Why do I feel this tug of war, of desires in my own chest? Why do I keep coming back to self-defeating behavior? Why does injustice rage when so many of us decry it as evil? Why can't we seem to fix the world's deepest problems, even with all our money and technology and and political prowess? And why do I even care? Why does it weigh on me so heavily? Consider this. Could it be that our souls are at war with another world? Now, in case anyone's feeling a little bit depressed and gloomy right now, (laughs) Let me ask some other questions as well as I finish. What if exile could be good for us? What if it is something to fight but not to fear? What if instead of losing our souls, what if instead of that we discovered them? And what if Jesus has a plan and purpose for us in exile that is far greater than we can imagine? And that's what we're going to be exploring over the coming weeks. Let's pray. Father, we just simply ask as we journey this teaching series over the coming weeks, Lord, that you'd open our eyes. We prayed about that earlier on. We spoke about that during the service. That you'd open our eyes to the realities of heaven and to the places where we're believing lies, we're living lies, and we're following paths that are not the wonderful, glorious, life-giving paths that you've chosen for us. ask that you would enlighten us, Lord, that you would reveal truth to us, that we would increasingly become the 
people of life and light and hope and joy that you have created us to be in this world. That we wouldn't be fearful of the culture we live in, but that we would bring the light and the life and the hope and the passionate love of Jesus to bear on those around us wherever we find ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.